I just want to do God's will. What you're seeking is a blessing from God. You must expect a miracle. You have the power of choice. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to Life Today Live. I'm Randy Robinson. Revival. That is a word we like to kick around in the church. Uh, it's a good thing. We, we always talk about how much we need it, uh, and I totally agree. How do you get there? I think that's that's the tough question. And how do you know when you're there? Uh, and can we do it? Or are we completely reliant on the Holy Spirit to do it? Uh, do we have a role? These are all good questions. Uh, and we're going to talk about revival because I know if you're a believer— you want to see it in your hometown, in your state or province, in your country, uh, and and it's an interesting topic. I have someone who is uh, very qualified to discuss this. Uh, not only is he the senior pastor at Harvest Rock Church out in Pasadena, California, um, he's the president of Harvest International Ministries, which has over 150 churches, uh, about 100 in California. Uh, he has fought the government in California uh, and gone to the Supreme Court and won recently. So we'll talk a bit about that. And he will continue to be on the front lines uh, fighting a lot of uh, really the the overreach of the government from a constitutional standpoint and some of the things that we as Christians would, would be you know convicted that we need to stand up for for even against the government so he's also got a book called turning our nation back to god through historic revival looks just like this and my guest is dr che on thrilled to have him on today uh and one note he is also uh, he has a degree in history so he's not just uh, googling this this is something that he has studied he understands and he's going to enlighten us today so great conversation chat is open hello judy loretta kim all the others out there you're invited to be a part of the conversation and as always we appreciate you guys when you share when you like follow subscribe so all that will will help uh, spread the word and maybe spark revival dr on great to have you on life today live well thank you what an honor to be with you randy Thank you for the great job you are doing to advance God's kingdom. So uh, thank you for that. Before we get into some of the book and, and the history of revival, which I'm fascinated in, I, I love studying history, um, I want to catch uh, people up with, with some of the recent things that have gone on just in the last couple of years with you uh, and your churches and other churches out in California. Walk us through a little bit of the battle that you fought over the last two years. Well, of course, we all had to lock down our churches uh, when President Trump asked for 30 days of mitigation in April of 2020. And we did that because we didn't know what COVID-19 was all about. And so we locked down. But my brother's a doctor, you know, a member of our church. He's a surgeon. And the numbers that Governor Newsom gave were just very, very frightful in the sense that he said out of 40 million in California, 20 million will get this virus, and he predicted 2 million would die just in the state of California. Mm. When you put those kind of numbers there, and by the way, it was not based on science. I think it's, again, just uh, fake news that goes out all the time from the government and from media. But we locked down. We mitigated. But going into May now, <clears throat> after sacrificing our Resurrection Sunday service, we have our annual conference in April called Global Summit, and people from around the world come to that particular conference. And then, of course, <clears throat> our church anniversary is also in April. So we just, you know, made a, made a major pause, a lockdown the church. But then with Pentecost Sunday coming up in May 31st, we just felt, uh, based on what we were seeing in California, that if we mitigated, if we encouraged those who are elderly, those who are high risk people to stay home, that we can gather with social distancing and worship, even though the governor had not declared us to be essential. And what's crazy is that all the grocery stores, Costco, Walmart were considered essential, but also abortion clinics, strip club in San Diego, mm. marijuana dispensaries were all declared essential, but the church was not. And we felt, and we wrote a letter to him and just said, uh, we believe the church has been essential for 2000 years and we need to open up to help people during this uh, crisis. So we opened 
And um, and so uh, to make a long story short, uh, he uh, really came down hard and locked down in July of 2020. And we decided not to lock down again because he had given a window with a mitigation of like 10% you could meet for 30 days. And he allowed that experimentation, but then locked down again in July. And with that, we just said, you know, we're, we're going to continue to open. But I wanted to call my attorney because I knew that I was violating their law and that I could get into trouble. And so I called him and I just said, I just need some legal background, back, a backup to protect me as we are going to continue to meet. And he said something to me, um, his Matt Staver with Liberty Council, oh, very yeah. well-known attorney, mm -hmm. a dear friend. And he said, you know, just change, just pray about suing the governor because there's so much discrimination against the church in California. And so I prayed about it and I was just reading uh, Joshua 1, Eight, uh, and just leapt out, you know, uh, during just my uh, study time, uh, the word says, have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Mm. Do not be dismayed, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you. And that uh, verse just gave me the courage to go ahead and sue the governor. I called our board, we all were in agreement, and we sued the governor. And immediately I got a letter from our city council prosecutor in Pasadena, um, and she said that we're going to arrest you. Uh, we're going to find your church members a thousand dollars per service that they've been meeting at. This is now August, uh, a month after we sued the governor. And then she said we reserve the right to arrest your church members. And I'm thinking to myself because Newsom was allowing prisoners out because of COVID crowdedness, and yet they want to arrest law-abiding citizens who have no record. We pay our taxes. We simply want to worship Jesus. And I said, this is madness. We have come to what Isaiah 520 says, woe to those who call good evil, yeah. evil good, darkness light, light darkness. And, um, and so um, I was ready to be arrested, but my attorney, Matt, asked for an emergency injunction to protect me from being arrested. And uh, again, uh, the courts are so liberal here that even though we went to a district court, and again, elections have consequences because it was an Obama appointed federal judge, and he gave us only 10 minutes by Zoom and said, this letter of arrest is, is valid. He will be arrested and we're not gonna give you uh, the reprieve that you're asking for. Then we went to the Ninth Circuit and appealed it went all the way to the Supreme Court, and in December, they weighed in on us and said it was unconstitutional to arrest a pastor. So that was our first time before the Supreme Court. Then in February of 2021, they heard the whole case of even the lockdown, and they said it was unconstitutional to lock down the church. And set a precedence for our nation uh, in perpetuity that we can now meet, uh, regardless of any kind of COVID or virus, that government cannot shut down the church is against the First Amendment rights that we have, that the state will not interfere with the free exercise thereof. And so we thank God. And then uh, on top of that, the ice on the cake was that um, uh, we were awarded $1.3 million settlement money to pay for our legal fees. And of course, that went to Matt and Liberty Council, but of course impacted us indirectly because we were supporting, uh, even though it was pro bono, we were giving offerings to Liberty Council and Matt called me up, sent me a picture of the check and said, you don't have to send us anymore. <laughs> and, send where. and so we are rejoicing, but the real battle is still raging in California. To give you a contrast and idea, 49 states had opened up in-person worship of some form. We were the 50th state to do so only because we won the lawsuit uh, in the Supreme Court. And so we would have continued to be locked down for weeks, maybe even months afterwards. That's how extreme it is here in California. So you were never arrested and no one in your church was ever arrested or fined, or did you have to fight that as well? No, uh, the, the first decision, we, we appealed to the district court, then to the Ninth Circuit, which is appeals court, and went all the way to Supreme Court. And in December, uh, they weighed in that it was unconstitutional to arrest yeah. me okay. for wanting to open up. And then the whole lockdown was decided a few months later in February. So we went before the Supreme Court right. twice, right. which is miraculous because 
you don't pick the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court picks you. Yeah, that's true. And they wait in. And so we give God all the glory. It's his doing and it's marvelous in our sight. Yeah, I didn't know if while it was being litigated, they had made any moves against you in the state. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad that you obviously didn't have to go through that. Um, and, and now, <laughs> wasn't, wasn't Governor Newsom the one that owned part of a a winery up in Napa Valley, and he closed down all the other wineries but left his open? Yes. And, of course, uh, when he locked down the restaurants, he's sitting at the French Laundry, which is a Michelin three-star restaurant, and uh, it was caught on video. Yeah. This hypocrisy, just like Nancy Pelosi, uh, you know, telling everyone that we have to lock down, but she's going to a hair salon. Now, the only reason why I bring that up is because one of our church members have a hair salon for the, really, uh, for the uh, actors in Hollywood. Mm. They do the Academy Awards, the Emmy, the Grammy, and they're very well known, and they lost their business. 18,000 businesses uh, went uh, bankrupt during the uh, 2020, 2021 lockdown. Mm. So it was absolutely criminal, and the hypocrisy behind it is just, you know, they don't believe it. They just do what they want to do, but they're telling us what to do, uh, which makes no sense uh, because the signs have shown that, yeah, it is It is a real virus, and people have died from it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but life is full of risk, and uh, just like every year, 40,000 or 50,000 die of the flu, influenza, and I think we could have just mitigated and trust us as adults to open up a restaurant with social distancing, take the temperature, Wear your mask, yeah, sure. but still operate instead of just make this simple draconian decree of lockdown, period. Yeah, well, and, and one that still favors your, you and your friends, which is a real sign of... Anyway, I will echo yeah. the sentiment of one of our viewers right now who says, thank you for your courage in defending our freedoms. You know, we wonder sometimes who's on the front lines of these things. Well, Dr. Ahn... Matt Staver, there were many others involved, but these are the guys that, did, that had to make the hard decision. Am I going to face possible imprisonment, fine, financial ruin, uh, harassment, all sorts of things, or am I going to take that stand, which now benefits everyone in the country? And so, you know, I, I know at the time it was probably just kind of trying to make the right decision at every turn, but in retrospect, what you, you did was – was huge for the nation and I think eventually for the world to at least see, you know, what's going on here. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. We had a terrific attorney. Matt is uh, just outstanding Mm -hmm. and he's gone before the Supreme Court a number of times and won. So I thank God for that. And again, we give him all the, all the praise and all the glory. Yeah. And Matt and Liberty Council are good friends of the ministry and we have so much respect for them. Now that fight's over. But you've still got a lot of fights on your hand, and you got some new ones that have popped up, especially if we're still waiting on the decision on Roe versus Wade to know if it's going to be overturned at the federal level, which will simply push it back to the state level. And so, you know, I know there's a lot of misconceptions out there on both sides of the issue, but the reality is we go from one federal fight to 50 state fights on the on the abortion issue and some others. What What do you what are you dealing with now? Uh, and well, we're dealing with uh, some of the most egregious uh, abortion bills that are coming, uh, including AB twenty two twenty three that would have legalized infanticide. But uh, in other words, a woman would not be penalized. Anyone, uh, including the doctor, would not be penalized up to thirty days after the birth of the child, after which the birth. would open the door for you to kill the baby if you were suffering from depression and with no repercussion legally. Now, 2,000 people went up to Sacramento uh, and uh, protested this bill. And so they modified it. And so they're now saying uh, that if there's any uh, in vitro, in other words, within up to the ninth month, there'll be no penalty, which is pretty much the standard for the extreme left Democrats who believe that it's legal to murder a baby on the last day of the ninth month. And that's President Biden's position as he ran for office and Kamala Harris. Um, but in, in Newsom with California, he's declared California to be a abortion sanctuary state. What he's saying basically 
is is that anyone who wants to get an abortion from a state that has uh, outlawed abortion can come here and get their abortion and they will cover the expense. And unfortunately, a lot of corporations have gone on the bandwagon. Citibank, for example, said any of their employees uh, who would like to get an abortion, but they live in a state where abortion is illegal. Now, these people are already uh, anticipating Roe v. Wade's overturned, and I believe it will be overturned myself because, again, President Trump, one of the best things he did was nominate three Supreme Court justices that are conservative, Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, and Amy Coney Barrett, as well as 300 other federal judges that mm-hmm. were confirmed uh, before his term ended. And, and we're seeing the benefit of it with our lawsuit because it was the conservative judges that weighed in and said it was a violation of our constitutional right of freedom of religion uh, to lock down the church. And so therefore we won and I feel it's gonna be overturned. But the point I wanna make is that it goes, as you said, on a state level. And on the state level, we are the number one abortion state and our taxes pay for abortion. And now he wants to increase that. So we will pay for other states abortion in our state. And it's gone so ridiculous. Even Starbucks have jumped in and said, we'll pay for any of our employees to come and, uh, and have an abortion and in California. And, and then they took it one step further. If you want to have a sex change, <laughs> uh, we will pay for your, uh, sex change, hormonal treatment, whatever. And so that's Starbucks position. So these companies have gone woke, but we saw with Disney, and I don't know if you know what happened with um, DeSantis, but also with Let Us Worship, my good friend, uh, Sean Foyt and uh, Jay Koopman, they went to Disney headquarters, they went to Disney World and Disneyland, they went there and protested, uh, protested, uh, that um, these um, uh, the president of Disney has said 50% of their characters in the future will be LGBTQ characters. And, you know, and they just basically uh, had a solemn prayer meeting and saying, um, not on our watch. And Disney stocks dropped mm-hmm. from $200 a share to 119 and um, and so we're now saying, if you go woke, you will go broke. <laughs> and I think we as uh, consumers, as uh, people in the United States, one way to battle corporations that are so woke and so extreme left is to boycott them. And so I, I'm not leading this, but I'm just making this as a, as a way that we can uh, uh, really and speak to the board members of these uh, companies and say, you got to get a different CEO, you have to get a different chairman of the board and do something about your company because we will boycott until you become more mainstream. And so anyway, that that's uh, what's going on in California. Uh, and uh, it's really sad even in my city of Pasadena. But you know, the devil replaced his hand because I've never seen California more awakened. I'm talking about the church. Uh, I'm seeing people running for office, like from our church alone, we have had a person run for city council, she won. We have had uh, people running for this upcoming midterm election for the city council on a local level, as well as people running for state assembly, state senate, and um, and the U.S. Congress. We have two of our HIM pastors who are part of our apostolic network. Uh, running for U.S. Congress, and one really has a shot because he's already the mayor of Walnut, California, mm. and he's in a conservative uh, district, and we believe that he's going to win. And 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 so I'm very, very proud of uh, the body of Christ stepping up to the plate and not receiving this um, narrative of separation of church and state, which is absolutely unscriptural. It's not Hebraic thinking. It's really influenced by Greek thinking and really uh, misunderstanding even um, Thomas Jefferson and, and what he did in 1801 with uh, when he wrote a letter of a wall of separation. It wasn't talking about that Christians should not be involved, but the state will not interfere with the church. Oh, yeah. I mean, you want to get into that. It, the, the short end of that is it was meant to protect the church, not to keep the church out of the state. And, and I appreciate you in, in your church members, your organization being involved in the community because I, I – I don't. I can't read the Bible and see where it says we are to not have an influence on this world. I mean, I think that's what we're supposed to be, you know, salt and light kind of thing. Not to be of this world, but to transform this world with, with the truth. And you're doing that. 
However, at the same time, I fully recognize that abortion's not going to go away unless we change people's hearts. Uh, until people find their identity in Christ, they're always going to be searching for something else to fill that. And I know you know that too, which is why I'll bring up your book, Turning Our Nation Back to God Through Historic Revival. So I, I find it very interesting that we spent the first half of this, most of this interview, talking about the action in the community, in the state, in the nation that you have, you have led, and I applaud that. And then you come out with a book talking about changing people's hearts. Why do you go? Why do you point to that direction? And how do we get there? Well, because understanding historic revival, I think uh, people have misunderstood historic revival. So one section, just one section, I give three characteristics of a historic revival, and I take a chapter for each point. And one of the points is that first of all, revival begins with the church. The church is awake and the church returns to her first love. The church repents of her sins, says Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people were called by my name, not the Congress, not the White House, not unbelievers, but God's people who are called on his name, will humble themselves and pray and then turn from their wicked ways. The sin, there's sin in the church uh, of lukewarmness, uh, not uh, you know obeying scripture or compromising as pastors from preaching the whole counsel of God. And so we have to repent. Then I'll hear from heaven, forgive their sins. Again, we need to have forgiveness of sins to have revival. And, and so judgment begins in the house of the Lord, it says then First uh, Peter 4, 17. The second characteristic of the historic revival is that the harvest comes in. And so we saw that with the Jesus People Movement in 1967 to 1977, 20 million young people came to know the Lord, and I gave my life to the Lord in 1973. Mm -hmm. So uh, millions got saved during that revival. And you could talk about the Walsh Revival, 1904 with Evan Roberts, 100,000 getting saved the first six months of that revival in Wales. Uh, you could talk about the uh, revival after World War II, the Latter Rain Revival, the Hebrides Revival, Billy Graham and his crusade in 49. Mm -hmm. uh, amazing number of souls got saved after uh, World War II. But the third part, and this is where uh, we, we, we stop, we think of revival, okay, the church is revived, harvest comes and that's revival, but I, I share the third is that society is transformed. We call that reformation and, re and institutions are reformed. That revival so impacts society that the family, which is the family institution, is reformed. Even government is reformed. Mm -hmm. People stop being corrupt because they have given their hearts to Jesus Christ. So the first is a harvest, the transformation of inward, but it begins to impact society. And the greatest example of that is uh, the whole slave trade and slavery in Great Britain during the Great Awakening in 1738. And Whitfield and Wesley started to started the Great Awakening. Um, there was a young man who came to know the Lord through through the whole Methodist movement, and a man named William Wilberforce. Mm -hmm. He was a Cambridge graduate. He was a member of Parliament. He knew that God had called him to work for reformation of society. Uh, and what he his interpretation of that is number one is to end the slave trade and slavery in Great Britain, because that was the number one source of income for them at that time. It's like what petroleum is to Russia today, uh, slave trade was to Great Britain at that time, because they had a monopoly. They had bought out the Portuguese, the Spaniards, to have this exclusive slave trade with uh, the West Indies. And then they would buy tobacco from America and bring it back to uh, Great Britain. And it was just incredible. Uh, cities were created because of the wealth that came from that. Yeah. Out of evil, though, because you're talking about trading human people made in the image and likeness of God. And so that revival transformed Great Britain because Slave Trade uh, Act, the Slave Trade Act of 1807 was passed in Parliament and slavery ended in 1833 without going through a civil war like we have had, had to go through. And so we see how Revival led to reformation. And I believe today the number one injustice issue, uh, biblical injustice issue, is killing of innocent lives. We're talking about babies. You now we just had the tragic 
shooting at Robb Elementary. The devil is going after our young people. Satan is a murderer. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And for the people to talk about gun laws and all that, um, yeah, you know, we, we could do a better job uh, with uh, background check, et cetera. But the real issue is the heart issue. Yeah. And people have uh, opened up their heart to demons, really. Mm. Uh, they're demonized. It's more than just mental health. It is a spiritual battle. It includes mental health. But it, it, it definitely uh, is a reflection of the brokenness of this planet, the sin nature, and the only solution is the gospel of the kingdom, that Jesus died for our sins, he rose again, he conquered the devil by taking away his authority, and now he has given us the authority to resist. So when you mention like we're to be salt and light, I want to go back all the way to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28 where he made man in his image, and then he blessed them. And then he said, be fruitful, multiply. But then he uses this one uh, Hebrew word that is very rare, it only appears twice in the Old Testament. It's a word kabas or subdue. Hmm. It means subdue the enemy. Today would be subdue the enemy and evil. And so as believers, God created us in his image to rule with him. Mm. And we are, anytime we see injustice, anytime we see evil, because the foundation of his throne, it says in Psalm 89, verse 14, is righteousness and justice. So we do what's right. We do what's just in society. And if we see something as as evil like abortion, we got to fight. And that's why I've been contending for uh, the reverse of Roe v. Wade. Uh, for the last uh, 49 years since I've been a believer. So interesting, I think, parallel. You, you look at Wilberforce in England fighting slavery. We all look back now and, and we're aghast that slavery ever existed, but it was the norm back then. It, it existed everywhere. But here's someone who uh, was really doing God's business on this earth, like you say, in subduing the evil of slavery, but he did it, what, in front of Parliament. And so to those who... who think, well, you know, the, the church issues are the church issues and the state, the state issues. I, I say that's that's not uh, just biblically unsound, it's historically unsound. And, and so I, I really do, I think it's a direct parallel to say, okay, we were dehumanizing people, trading them, their lives didn't matter. It was rooted in some really awful science of Darwinism. Um, and obviously, if we would say spiritually, it was <laughs> rooted in the kingdom of darkness, right, Satan. Uh, I think the same thing's true right now with abortion. It's rooted in really awful science. Science does not support well, abortion. The thing is, is that the science is becoming clear, but no one's uh, really listening to science. You know, what I mean by that is, is that the biggest argument is, is my body. I have a freedom to choose. It's an invasion of my privacy. But the reality is not your body. We have another body inside yeah, you yeah. and has a different chromosome, has different blood type, mm. uh, has a different DNA that is unique, fearfully and wonderfully made, as made in the image and likeness of God. And for you to kill that baby is murder. Now, I'm not saying this to condemn anyone who had an abortion, because if you know Jesus Christ, uh, no matter what sin you've committed, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Mm -hmm. But we have to recognize that this, uh, the, the, the killing of innocent blood brings a curse on a land. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think Abraham Lincoln in his second inaugural address uh, was, gave this incredible statement. And he says, fondly we hope, fervently we pray, this mighty scourge of war will come to a speedy end. But if every drop of blood from the lash is paid for by every drop from the sword, then let it be said, as it was said 2,000 years ago, the judgments of God are just and true mm. together. And here's the point is that, is it possible that we're having these shootings of kids because the culture of life has been so diminished by abortion, has opened up the door to evil. People wondering what's going on. Yes, there's racism in Buffalo, but even Sandy, uh, uh, Hook uh, Elementary School 10 years ago with another teenager who also shot his mom, by the way, mm. just like this young man shot his grandmother mm. and then killed all these kids. Is it possible that we've opened the door 
of murder because of abortion. I believe so. And th there, there is a curse that whoever sheds blood by man, his blood will be shed. And so we read that in Genesis 9. And that's why we're asking God to heal our land. That's why we've had all these call events. Uh, my friend Lou Engel is the visionary founder of the call, but I was the president of the call from 2000 to 2003. We organized stadium events and people don't realize the main reason why we did that was to end Roe v. Wade. We mm -hmm. prayed of ourselves that God would reverse the curse, reverse Roe v. Wade. And then we asked the young people to make a pledge to vote life, you know, uh, and, and I want to encourage those who are watching is just in perpetuity, vote life. Don't vote for any candidate that's pro-abortion. Yeah. And if you don't know, do research. And if they are uh, pro-abortion, but you still like them, I would still not vote for them because you will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I really believe that in 2 Corinthians 5.10, that we would have to give an account for our actions, whether good or bad, here in this lifetime as believers. And so this is a very, very serious, uh, but I feel that I have to speak the truth in love because I do feel that our nation. Now, the good news, I believe, on this 49th year of Roe v. Wade, which is a jubilee year, a lot of people don't realize the jubilee actually begins on the 49th year, according to Leviticus 25. In other words, the 49th year is when God blesses you so much with surplus that on the 50th year, you don't work and you live off the surplus in an agrarian culture. And I believe the 49th year of Roe v. Wade this year, he's allowing us to have the reversal. He's heard our prayers. We've humbled ourselves. We fasted and we asked God for mercy. And I believe Roe v. Wade is going to be overturned. Uh, but again, the real battle begins on a state level. Yeah. And so I, I do believe that America will be saved and we're going to see the greatest revival in the history of the church. Be encouraged. Those of you who are praying and fighting and whatever level of action you're taking because you're on the right side you're on god you know, god god is on your side you're on god's side you're whatever you you're on the right side and i believe on the right side of history as well i think some generations will look back and go how did they kill their own children uh and and so let's keep moving that direction let's keep believing for that we know that light overcomes darkness good overcomes evil and so we can be encouraged in that uh dr Anna, i want to show people your website real quick this is Cheon.org. Uh, and so you can check out all things related to, to Harvest and all that he's doing, you know, through that website. Good touch point for you. Uh, and Dr. Ron, I, I just can't thank you enough for your, your stand, the things you've done. Um, but I also want to thank you for your time today. Appreciate you being here and sharing with our audience. Thank you, Randy. God bless you and your ministry. And uh, you guys out there, I mean, this is a good one to share. Let's get the word out. Let's be encouraged, by the way. Uh, just know that light overcomes darkness, and we are, Jesus is the light of the world. And then he turned around and said, you are the light of the world. We, we reflect his light. So let's go be light, and let's do it with a smile on our faces, but let's do it with a, a seriousness uh, because we are in a battle, but the battle is the Lord's, and we will win. Appreciate you being here. We'll see you again next time here on Life Today Live. Most of you all Trusted to be gained the whole world, but lose.